While working with Steve Kress on the book Project Puffin, my wife and medical researcher Michelle Holmes asked us, now don't get me wrong, putting the puffins back is a phenomenal accomplishment. But if interns have to stay every summer on Eastern Egg Rock, how is it a sustainable project? That is an important question. Cress began the project in 1973 by bringing little chicks down from Newfoundland, raising them in handmade burrows, and watching them bounce into the ocean on the unproven lark that the birds would remember Eastern Egg Rock, a tiny seven-acre jumble of rocks in Muscongas Bay, as their native home. He conceived of the project amid the backdrop of the first Earth Days, the expansion of the Clean Air Act, the creation of the Clean Water Act, and the federal banning of the pesticide DDT, which wreaked havoc on the entire ecosystem, and most famously among birds, the bald eagles, osprey, and peregrine falcons. Back then, there was still much talk about restoring the so-called balance of nature. Steve himself thought a sustainable project meant getting puffins in Maine back to a population where it could survive on its own as it did before European settlement. Four decades later, it is clear that can never happen. And that begs the question, is there any lasting importance in a project where, if it ever stopped, great blackback gulls and herring gulls and bald eagles would come back and wipe everything out? The answer is yes. The project began as an unprecedented attempt to restore a colorful and charismatic seabird to an island nearly a century after humans hunted them into local extinction. Today, the Atlantic puffin is a living definition of modern stewardship. And we need that stewardship more than ever. The threats that affect birds such as puffins are far greater today than the bullets of gunners of the late 1800s. Humans have so altered the landscape and the oceans that a small island such as Eastern Egg cannot escape the effects of humanity, even in sparsely populated Maine. Egg Rock is an island connected to the mainland, not by a bridge, of course, but by a web of creatures from plankton to predator and from garbage landfills to the fishing waste of passing lobster boats. These support huge numbers of gulls, and each gull is always looking for the next meal, and those meals do include puffins. Also, the very success of other coastal conservation efforts over the past century have nurtured other voracious threats to the puffin, such as bald eagles, owls, mink, and river otters. None of them find the six miles between Eastern Egg and the mainland any obstacle to dinner. The puffins now also stand for something else that Cress did not originally consider. From the U.S. to the U.K. and from Canada to even Iceland, where puffins still number in the millions, the bird is now a canary of climate change and a sentinel warning us of how we are dramatically overfishing our oceans for the very forage fish seabirds eat. You might say that forage fish, like the herring that puffins like to eat, are the ethanol of the sea. Where the vast majority of corn grown in the United States today is for fuel, 90% of forage fish catch ends up at fish farms and pig and poultry feed. According to the Pew Charitable Trusts, which funded research by scientists at the University of British Columbia, the world's pigs and poultry now eat six times more fish than Americans. How fast could a seabird population collapse from these modern threats? One dramatic example is the African penguin. There were likely one and a half million to three million African penguins in the early 20th century off the coast of South Africa and Namibia. But by 2009, the population had crashed to just 26,000 breeding pairs and is now listed as endangered 
because of commercial fishing, oil pollution, and warming waters that drive their anchovies and sardines too far away to feed on. Can the Atlantic puffin suffer such a similar fate? The birds that Crest restored may be the first of the species to answer that question. On the surface, all may seem well, because in the summer of 2014, Project Puffin set a new record of 148 pairs of breeding puffins on Eastern Egg. And when there were only a few dozen puffins on just one island in Maine at the start of the project, which was Matinicus Rock, there are now more than 1,000 breeding pairs of puffins on four islands. But the puffins of Maine are at the absolute southernmost end of their known breeding range in North America. And the last few years have brought dramatically variating water temperatures, including the warmest waters ever recorded in the Gulf of Maine in 2012. In Europe, warmer waters are already being linked to less food and less reproduction for puffins in Norway, Scotland, and Southern Iceland. In New England, warmer waters are already resulting in dramatic shifts of some underwater creatures. Lobsters as a species have moved more than 40 miles north in the last decade. The kinds of fish puffins have been bringing ashore in recent years to feed their chicks has also changed dramatically with more and more species more associated with mid-Atlantic waters. The good news is that Canadian and Maine puffins are amazingly adaptable to catching whatever is available. One researcher in New Brunswick discovered 51 species of marine life in the feces of puffins. But the concern is that while some species are edible, nutritious, and the right shape for chicks, other species are not. And the unknown question is what will be available in the coming decades. Perhaps the biggest lesson Crest learned from Project Puffin is that there actually is no such thing as balance. John Critcher, author of the 2009 book, The Balance of Nature, The Enduring Myth, wrote, the balance of nature, whatever it is, and whatever it will become, is our choice and, I would argue, our moral responsibility. Or, as Canadian seabird researcher Tony Diamond told me in 1986 when I did my first story on Project Puffin, it's time somebody played God after our predecessors played the devil for so long. One of Cress's top mentors, the late ecologist Bill Drury, seconded that notion by saying, if we don't play God, the gulls will. To play someone other than the devil will require utmost vigilance. In 1973, Crest set out to restore just one bird with a handful of people. But in the process, he learned that an entire ecosystem also had to be restored and protected especially turn populations whose screeching and dive bombing provide cover for puffins. Since its beginning, the project has been maintained with the aid of more than 500 college and graduate school interns. They represent a special ecosystem in and of themselves. Like Cress himself, who grew up chasing lizards in suburban Columbus, Ohio, many of the interns grew up chasing lizards, raising ducks, building houses for worms and newts, and even reassembling porcupine skeletons. In 2009, I asked the crew of Eastern Egg Rock what they also remembered about their childhoods that helped them appreciate nature enough to relish working on isolated islands to support seabirds. With almost no hesitation, one said, we didn't watch TV. Another one said, hmm, we didn't have TV either. A third said, well, we had TV, but no video games. This is blasphemy in mainstream culture, yet these interns represent the cutting edge of what many experts realize we need today in a world 
where a disturbing percentage of people are disconnected from the natural world. Here, preserving the puffin, are young adults who as children were able to play outdoors and explore on their own without the fear of getting muddy while putting their hands on frogs, salamanders, and other small creatures, or even playing hide and seek in cemeteries. Thus today, the puffins and the young people who have taken care of them represent something much more important than the mere opportunity for you and me to view a beautiful bird. Many of the interns of yesteryear have gone on to run zoos, direct state and provincial wildlife programs, and help skyscraper builders and wind turbine developers avoid killing birds. The techniques used on Eastern Egg, including the translocation of chicks and decoys, have now been used to bring back or relocate nearly 50 species of seabirds in 14 countries. This is how Project Puffin, to answer my wife's original question, is indeed a sustainable project. By spreading hope for the preservation of seabirds well beyond the restoration of one bird and sending forth into the world a new generation of conservationists. The return of the puffin to seven acres of jumbled rocks off the coast of Maine should inspire all of us to look at other places where species have been lost and vow to return them. The puffin represents a touchstone of what can happen when we dare to try. This is Derek Jackson for Project Puffin. Mm.